Welcome everybody to this week's uh, edition of Military Trailblazer Office Hours. Thank you for taking the time out of your Wednesday evening to spend it here in the spirit of community, mentorship, and learning. I'm your host for this evening, Dave Albright, lead uh, solution engineer at Salesforce and a military trailblazer. Each week we invite a co-host or co-host to take part in the conversation so we can leverage their experience, expertise, and unique perspective. The focus for tonight's session is hiring manager tips and guidance to launch your solution engineer career. So if you ever wondered what solution engineer role is the right fit for you or how to get hired as an SE, this is the session for you. All right, I'd like to welcome and briefly introduce our co-host for tonight's session, Brian Strantman. Brian is currently a vice president of solution engineering at Salesforce with over 20 years of experience in the industry. Prior to Salesforce, he worked at numerous global IT companies, including VMware, Oracle, Dell, and Sun Microsystems. And before starting his career in IT, Brian served as an officer in the Air Force for eight years. So Brian, it's great to uh, have you co-host with us tonight. Dave and I obviously know you quite well since you are our boss. So <laughs> welcome. Yeah, well, hey, thanks, Dave and Dave. I appreciate it. Would you like to take a moment to quickly introduce yourself and share your Salesforce story a little more? Yeah, you bet. And, and by the way, I've literally been on a Zoom call all day in training. So if you see me fidgeting or my looks like my neck hurts, it does. It hurts pretty bad right yeah. now. So, yeah. So, I mean, as as Dave said, I, I was in the Air Force, uh, I, although I did not spend my entire career as an officer, just so everybody knows. I was enlisted in logistics and then I got my commission in comms and computer science. And I worked at AFITC down in San Antonio Intelligence Agency. And so, you know, when I was getting to about the eight plus, you know, year mark, I had to make a decision, right? I mean, I didn't want to go over 10 years and then leave and, and miss out on a retirement. So I, I was, uh, this was during kind of the drawdown era. And so I was seeing my 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 uh, my buddies, you know, getting early early outs, forced out, and stuff like that. So I just kind of decided to like to take matters into my own hands and uh, and try my luck in the in the commercial world. And at the time, I you know there really weren't any transition plans. You know, none of the military branches had any sort of transition services or anything like that. So the journey for me was maybe a little bit different than what you have today. And on top of that there really weren't any commercial initiatives to try to enable veterans to you know make a good transition into commercial so i did the safe thing i i went to work literally for the contractor that used to work for me when i was in the air force i think a lot of people did that back then maybe a lot still do it today and and i i kind of realized about a year into it that i wasn't going to be happy writing code in a skiff in a dark room where people shove sandwiches under the door for lunch, right? I, I just I just realized I needed windows and doors and ways to come and go. So very fortuitously, the, the solution engineer that covered the Air Force for Sun Microsystems reached out to me and said, hey, we're going to go to a dedicated DOD team across the board and I think you'd make a great solution engineer. Well, it was called system engineer there. You might hear it called systems engineer, solutions engineer, sales consultant, sales engineer. We call it solution engineer at Salesforce, but SE is or SC are the terms that you'll hear out in the, in the commercial world. And uh, I had no idea what it was at the time, but I said, hmm, I love Sun Microsystems. I was a huge workstation and server fan back then we used it at work and i was very comfortable with it so i said why not right and it uh, you know it was really kind of a leap of faith in a way because i didn't know the role but i figured if, if he thought i could do it i probably could which you know really i i think at this point i like to just share with you what it looks like to be an se whether you're whether you're in infrastructure or software or, or what have you. And so I'm gonna share my screen here. So what does an SE do? This is like a cartoonish way to say what an SE does. And it's it's really all these things. You take on a number of roles. You don't have to be an expert in any one particular role there, but you kind of have to know how to navigate all of them, right? So the big arrows are important, but the, really the number one role is you're part of the sales team. You're not responsible for a quota people get scared they hear sales oh my gosh i got a quota i don't know if i'm going to be able to make it trying to sell for a living but you're part an integral part of the sales team especially in in a software company or, or a hardware company where 
you you have to overcome the technical objections that are you know going to get thrown at you, especially in defense, right? You all know you've seen all the compliance regulations and the stigs and all those kinds of things that, that they throw at you. Like, well, you don't you're not on the Army Gold Master, or you're not on the you know X Y Z, right? And so you're the expert that comes in and, and helps the account executive sales rep position the products with the customer. And also you have to know their environment so you can speak their language, right? It's about, it's about building demos. Once you figure out what the customer needs, it's about being a customer experience guru, meaning, you know, you can help them map out their, their journey on a daily basis and how to use technology to make that journey easier, better, simpler, more efficient. You got to be a product specialist on a wide variety. So I'd say, you know, at, at the 10,000 foot level, not necessarily down in the weeds. And then you also need to be an IT architect and a product manager. So it sounds like a lot uh, and it sounds overwhelming, but it really isn't. And uh, I found really quickly after about six months when I was scratching my head, oh my gosh, I don't know what I'm doing. All of a sudden it clicked. And it, for me personally, based on my personality, based on my knowledge and based on my complete, you know, thirst for education and, and, and being able to help customers, it was just the perfect fit for me as a systems engineer. Probably about seven, eight years after I was in the SE role, I, I decided I want to put my, my foot in the water for a leadership position. I moved away from DOD, which was my bread and butter and started doing state and local solution engineering as an SE manager. And I've been doing that, as, I think, since 2001 now. So more than 20 years just as a manager. And I think I'm well past my silver anniversary now, Dave, you know, in the SE role. So I, you know, I would say if you, if you want advice, if you want uh, mentorship or whatever, I'm, I'm probably a pretty good person to reach out to if you're interested in the SE role. Dave and Dave are also both really good. And I think Greg Lee, I saw him join the, the call as well. He's he's one of the managers on my team. Also great resource. And I and, and I'm not talking about just at Salesforce. I can I can also talk about industry practices as well. And most of what I'll talk about here will be applicable to all of it. So let me just take a breath and ask if there's any questions so far. Yeah, I think I'm going to open some questions up, but I think especially as we get into the hiring manager side, we'll probably get more from the crowd. You know, just to, to say thank you very much for volunteering to co-host. You know, it does take time from your schedule and you've been sitting in front of Zoom all day like we, most of us kind of do in this job. Yeah. And a quick overview of the session purpose for everyone too to kind of talk about. For those joining for the first time, we always like to briefly explain the purpose of the office hours and before we open the floor to questions and discussion. These are just informal sessions and get together for gathering with military tra trailblazers and allies to explore kind of the non-technical Salesforce career and, and branding related topics, kind of help you achieve your professional development and career related goals, and really just get information about the ecosystem as you, as you get more experience in it. The next hour is intended to be an opportunity for collaborative mentorship. Everyone on the call is, is encouraged to step up, help answer questions from your perspective, which will provide additional diversity or experience to the answers given. Please keep an eye on the chat window during tonight's session. I and others on this call share a lot of great information there, including learning, networking, employment opportunities. If you'd like to ask a question at any point during today's session, please feel free to do so. If you don't feel as comfortable speaking up, you can also post your questions in chat. We'll, we'll be watching for that. I'll do my best to monitor the chat window and also be looking for raised hands. And finally, tonight's session is being recorded. So if you'd like to share an attribution-free comment, please let me know before speaking and we'll make sure it's edited out of the final recording. With that, we kind of talked a little bit about what an SE does, Brian, of which I kind of wish I had seen that long ago before I started the job, because that's really a great overview of it. But what I wanted to do is I think a lot of the audience here probably understands, you know, the consultant role, the admin role, and now a little bit the SE role. How do those three kind of differ in your mind? Yeah. Um, well, before I do that, let me just let me just do one more thing, which is as you make the decision to, uh, you know, let's say leave the military or you're a military spouse and you want and you're you're now on the on the career hunt somewhere, um, maybe because 
you know, you're not part of the military family anymore, you know, assignments over, spouses out of the military. I, I just want to say when you make that decision to go after something new, and he, this applies even if you're not military veteran or spouse, right? Is I learned that you, you first, you got to take a leap of faith and get out of your comfort zone. So like I said, that, that diagram is daunting, but don't think of it that way. Think of it as a way to get out of your comfort zone and look for something new. Seek mentorship, you know, before you, in, before and after you make that, uh, career change decision. Uh, there's a lot of people out there that are Roddy, Maribus. There's a lot of individuals out there on LinkedIn. You can just reach out to them and say, Hey, I'm thinking about this new role. What do you think? You know, and most of them are very willing to, to jump in and help you, even if you don't know them. And then I'd say also go into every new role with a beginner's mindset, right? I, I think we all did that in the military, but same thing applies. In, in the commercial world as well. Okay, so you asked a question about what's the difference between a consultant and, and an SC, really? Is that what you asked me? Correct. Admin, yeah. so, I think most people on here are, are used to the, the, the concept of the admin and the consultant, but the yep. SE or SE is, is kind of new. Yeah, yeah, right. And so, I mean, I will, uh, I'm going to take a phrase out of, out of one of my professors in college, and I won't, I know it's, it's no longer probably PC to, to use the accent. So I'm just going to say he would always often answer questions with the, with the phrase, same thing, only different. So you'd ask him, you know, what's this versus that same thing, only different. And I thought, what in the world? I mean, why are you saying that? Well, now it all makes sense. All these years later, you can definitely relate one role to another. You can definitely relate one technology to another. So when someone says, you know, what's the difference? Well, it's the same thing, only different between consulting and, and uh, solution engineering, right? There's some some things that are similar, like continuous problem solving. You gotta have that mode. You gotta be in that mode all the time because you never know when the next big challenge is gonna pop up in front of you or someone makes a decision. Well, you can't use solution A anymore. You have to use solution B because of compliance or because of some decision someone else in the chain of command made, right? I think the you're you're in both roles you're in a selling mode all the time even if you don't realize it right uh the difference is between the two as a consultant you're selling what extensions to the contract more pws you know product work brown work work breakdown right i i need to do more i need to build more hours so that you can accomplish this new thing and then for us as a as a subscription based software company you're always selling, even after you sold the product, you're selling renewals, right? Because if we, if a customer doesn't like what they're using, they can, they can, uh, you know, stop the renewal and thus that results into an attrition, which hurts our long-term revenue. So we're, we're always in selling mode. I'd say both roles have a degree of evangelism that goes with it, right? So you're, you're always a representative of your company. You're always talking about the new, or relevant technologies that are coming out that are going to help that customer who's already made an investment even more successful and so forth, right? Another common one is project management. The difference is project management for a consultant is deliverable product management, project, project management. For an SE, it's making sure that the rest of the ecosystem is doing the right things to ensure that your product is going to be successful at the end of the day because if a systems integrator delivers a bad product who looks bad well they probably look bad but we also look really bad right the customer is going to question their investment and decide well i shouldn't have invested in salesforce i should have invested in microsoft or something right so project management without the official um, title we got to be in there making sure that you know, we're being heard that we're helping customers eliminate barriers and reacting when something goes wrong, kind of from the side. There's another role at Salesforce that shares that, but has even more responsibility there. And that's the customer success manager. And so if you want to hear more about that, I think Dave probably has one of these sessions with the customer success manager on it. So that's kind of, that was the main things I thought to talk about here. Is anything else specific? 
No, I, I think that's actually a good overview of it. And I see a couple CSMs in the uh, in the list here too, if they want to pop in. It, like you said, it's funny, you look at this, what does an SE do? And, and I think Larry Lee commented that that looks like a lot, but when I was on an implementation team and a lot of the SEs that work on our team came from that role, they were consultants before they came over to be SEs. You do a lot of the same stuff. Your focus may be a little deeper or maybe you work with that customer longer as you do a build and you're a little more into the agile process or, or you know, in the, in the actual build phase yeah. and you're worried about sprints and stuff like that. But some of our customers, you know, just because of their peculiarities, we're with them for a year or, or longer and maybe even longer than that because it's just the, the long handover as it goes from sales to post sales and you know you're still supporting it kind of post sales sometimes so a lot of that same stuff happens and i remember doing all these same things when i was on implementation team so i guess another i guess you, you brought up another point there i guess another one is is depth and ownership so the consultant their ownership is on a deliverable production level product you know uh, after all the sprints are done they got to deliver something that's going to work and be supported and so forth right and the difference for us is we're more focused on art of the possible and so we don't need to build production quality demos right we can't we don't have enough time so you know things that we demo we have to be able to talk around what if they say click here, well, guess what? There's nothing behind that. So I always liken it to, you know, if you think about a, a Western movie, right? And you've got a saloon and there's a piano player and a bar and, you know, a bunch of bourbon on the, on the, on the bar and stuff like that. If you were to pan back, you never see this in the movie. If you were to pan back, you'd see there's maybe no roof. Maybe there's a bunch of cameras. There's a bunch of lights. Well, there weren't lights in the in 1800s. So, you know, it, it it's, it's, I'm not going to say smoke and mirrors because it has to look realistic and it, and you have to be able to back it up, right? So, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have the all the little special effects behind the scenes already built into our demo environment, but we may stop at, hey, click on the red button. What does that do? Well, you know, I haven't implemented that. that. That wasn't part of this demo, right? But we could certainly do that. And maybe here's some ways you could do it. And I see Carrie's got a uh, hand raised. So you're pre-sale, you know, you're not really fully building yet. Are there other companies still bidding and competing or is there a contract already signed and you're moving from there? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, yes. So usually we're still bidding. We may have already won some piece of the business. Um, so we may be going after a second deal. You know, I always call it looking east and west in, in your customer account. Like where else can we fit? So, so it's usually in the middle of a procurement or sometimes we kind of slide over a little bit into the post sales, which would be like, oh, hey, can you help me find a resource that can tell me how to do a better uh, analytics report or, and then we just call Greg Lee and he'll, he'll handle it all for us, right? <laughs> but, you know, so most, mostly we're on an active procurement and even if we're not, we're trying to get to the next procurement. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you. Okay. I think that's really good to talk about the uh, the difference. That's probably the biggest difference between really the delivery implementation side and the solution engineers. We need to build a demo to show the customer that it will meet their use case and will solve their problems. Whereas implementation, you're really kind of doing that full production. So everything needs to work to the specs. Right. And, and, if you and think that's about a huge when, difference. When does the sale happen? Two things have to occur. One, there has to be a budget, right? You have to be able to spend the money. But more importantly, on our side, what we care about is overcoming all customer objections, right? Or mitigating them, right? So that's our job as an SE is to make sure we understand what the objections might be and cover those and make sure that they're they're confident and comfortable with the solution. And then it's the account executive's responsibility to make sure that there's a budget and, a, and, and all the contractual stuff that happens on the other side. So next question. I think you really kind of talked about the SE, but you know, I, you've done SE so long, you probably think this is probably the best choice. What would you think is a, a downside to being an SE? 
Yeah, uh, that's interesting. Uh, y- so you don't always win, right? There's competition <laughs> out there. That's true. And sometimes the competition, let's say, is more compliant or they just have better access to the customer or you don't know what you don't know and, and who, who the who's pulling the strings at the account, right? And so sometimes you lose. Uh, and 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 so at the end of the day, it's important that we that we win. We we uh, we achieve ACV for us, which is called an- annual contract value. So we're a subscription service. We revenue is a little bit different for us. You know, a computer company when they when they sell you a laptop, they take revenue right then and there for a subscription. Customer signs up, and then over the course of several months, they 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 pay for it, and so you don't recognize actual revenue until they cut the check. But the uh, annual contract value is what we're responsible for, meaning we get somebody to sign a, a contract that yes, we're going to use Salesforce for one year, two years, three years, whatever it is, and then we move on to the next opportunity and the next opportunity. So it can be daunting. You do a lot of presentations. You build a lot of demos. Some of the demos that you build are because you're negotiating with the account executive and they convince you, yep, this is qualified. Yep, you should spend, you know, 57 hours building this demo and you need to work the weekend to go build a data model to show that it works. And sometimes maybe you didn't ask enough questions or maybe they didn't and you believed them and it never had a chance. I mean, it's possible, right? It'd be like putting, you know, uh, cause they, I'm going to use this example cause they just beat my team, which is really sad, but Appalachian state. Okay. Put Appalachian state on the field with the Tampa Bay Buccaneers. You know, that's that sometimes you're faced with that situation, right? So that would be your downside in my opinion. Uh, you definitely have to be up for continuous learning too, because what we, we roll out one release every every four months and uh, it goes live. So you better know as an SE what's in that release so that when the customer asks you, you don't, you don't look like yet, you don't have any idea what you're talking about. Right. So those are the kinds of things I'd say, or that maybe the downside, but if you like that, then it makes it really appealing. Yeah. I, I sometimes think we're a little bit of a jack of all trades, master of none, right? We touch a lot of products and, and, in ours, yeah. you know, vertical, we only touch a few products. We don't touch all of them, but some of the other SEs touch all the products and trying to stay on top of that knowledge and be able to build something very quickly and demo it effectively is is tough. Whereas maybe if you're just doing implementation, you're only working with sales cloud or service cloud, experience cloud, things like that. So you may be much greater depth of knowledge in, in any one cloud. And, and sometimes we only have to know it well enough to demo it. So we kind of learn it and we're out of there. Right. Go ahead, Dave. Yeah, just a quick point that you brought up, and it's interesting because to your point, like for our specific business unit, you know, I think our onboarding was two or three months, right? We're, we're we have constraints on government cloud that things we can and can't show based upon the security and compliance restrictions, and so we don't have to learn necessarily the full product portfolio. So three months, like we're off to the races. I was talking with a lot of you, a lot of you folks know Roger Miranda, who is is a core SE, you know, prize corporate sales. And he has to know the full product portfolio. So his onboarding was almost a year and he has to learn everything. So depending on where you want to focus your career journey will depend on how long your onboarding is, your, your product portfolio and what you have to know and things of that nature. So just another factor to take into account. Yeah, and Pat Lee just made a good comment. It sounds like this job is for more experienced people. And I don't know if I agree and I'll, I'll let I'll pass this over to you, Brian. What what do you think are the good competencies and characteristics that uh, you would look for in out evaluating solution engineers? Yeah, well, you know what? Just happen to have a slide for that. <laughs> <laughs> There's a slide for that. Right. So core competencies. I mean, in, it's any company is going to have a variation. They may, may not call it exactly the same thing that we call it, right? Um, but I alluded to some of these earlier, right? Uh, and and there's not one that's necessarily more important than another one. So I, I didn't stack rank them in any kind of order. But uh, and I, Dave, I, I'm sure you can probably share these slides like a PDF or something later, as well, just so people have a chance. And I don't want to I don't want to read through all of them. But you know, yeah. solutioning obviously really important, right? Is identifying the compelling value proposition. Uh, you do some discovery with a customer. You figure out what's important to them. And then based on your knowledge of the technology, 
you get to decide this is what we want to present. There may be some negotiation with the account executive and maybe other members of the SC team internally to kind of hone in on the right solution. But at the end of the day, you're, you're the one responsible if you own that customer for demonstrating your understanding of their problem and how Salesforce can solve it. You know, obviously risk mitigation, no, knowing what stumbles, you know, what areas you might stumble on like compliance or, you know, whatever. And then being able to communicate with a group of people or with a senior executive, you might be, let's see, well, I don't think it was you, Dave, but we just recently had a, a, a corporate event out in California where, where the SC was in front of a three-star, a two-star, and an a SES one. Pretty much those are the only people in the room. And they had to do a demo for those people. I was in maybe three years into my role, I was on stage with Scott McNeely, the CEO of Sun Microsystems and the governor of Texas and 400 people in a conference, right? So you just never know what's gonna be thrown at you. I was talking in that training earlier today, somebody said the first day in their job, they found out that the Dreamforce presenter for their group got in an accident and you're gonna to have to present later this afternoon, right? So you gotta be comfortable with communicating in all sorts of settings. You know, whether it's virtual on a webinar, whether it's, you know, slides, whiteboarding, standing up in front of 10 technical people working through a whiteboard session or, you know, presenting to uh, 100 people. And I'm not going to say it happens every day, but definitely have to be comfortable with it. And the rest you can uh, take a gander at later as Dave puts out the slides. And then at Salesforce, everybody has their whole, I their whole idea of characteristics. We use the, what we call great characteristics model. So in the outer portion of the wheel, you know, you see Salesforce smart, and that doesn't just mean you're smart on the technology. It also means you understand how we sell, you understand the groups inside of Salesforce and how they can help you. So we're, we're a win as a team kind of organization. So you have to understand how the corporation uh, works. And if you're going to ask for something, how do you work through that with, uh, with the other folks, right? get it done. So we have this concept of the V2 mom. I'll have a link at the end where you can actually go to trailhead and learn about V2 mom and what that is. And I'll, I'll describe it a little bit later too. Then motivate and champion. So uh, you kind of run your business from the technical side. You've got to be able to gain support from the rest of the folks in the organization to, to help you make your case. Or like in my case, we needed to have FedRAMP DOD impact level four compliance and, and now impact level five coming up to meet certain customer requirements. So I've got to be able to go to engineering and say, you need to make an investment in this and this is what it's going to do for us, right? Now, that's that would be a leader's role, not necessarily an individual contributor role, but anyway. And yes, there is a V2 mom module and I, and I have the link to it at the end. Courageous communicator. So, you know, being able to have conversations, tell tell the whole story, be transparent, but also be, you know, be confident while not being arrogant, right? So that's that's what we mean by courageous communicator. And then the last one is when is it, and again, no, no order really for this, but the last one is when is the team. So this is the big differentiator but to me between Salesforce and Oracle as Oracle was a individual sport at Salesforce, we win as a team. You can you can lose if you want to, but you better make sure it's because you engaged all your resources. Because if you lose all on your own, it's probably not going to be looked at well, right? Well, why didn't you try this? Why didn't you ask this person? You know, so that's what that means by win as a team. Any questions on the characteristics and, uh, and the competencies? Yeah, I think when I came in, you know, a lot of people talked about the three legs of the stool, right? The technical competence, depth of knowledge with the with the customer and the soft skills, right? And I think when I came in, I really thought it was more about the technical competence. And I think I was 5X when I came over. And now I think my opinion has changed dramatically after being an SE for over a year now, that I think really the soft skills and the depth of knowledge with the customer is more important. Right. right, being able to relate to the customer and and talk about things from their point of view and see have the empathy with them and understand where they're coming from, know some of their challenges and problems, and then just being able to communicate to them. Like, I think everyone on here can relate as you've gone through your careers. You've probably met really smart people 
in in whatever your field is in the military, but they were so smart you couldn't stand talking to them. And that's not going to make a good SE, right? They yeah. may know everything, but it's going to be super painful and it's going to turn the customer off very yeah. quickly. That's what I mean by the arrogance piece, right? We, we've yes. got to be humble in, in our communication because you won't be able to gain support if you don't do that well. Yeah. And, and I see Chloe and already offered up. She came straight from the Navy, no tech experience. I think um, 1X, maybe 2X when she came over, but has been an outstanding hire and just has incredible people skills and able to relate to the customer. And uh, that is huge. Right. Um, so with that, and there, there's numerous paths and we're, we're talking, most of us on here are kind of coming from the same division here. But do you want to talk about some of the differences between the the other paths like ECS and field core versus cloud and feature specialists? Yeah, sure. So I mean, basically, there's there's uh, two types of account focused SEs. One is field. What that means is, and actually, I, I can put numbers to it. If it's a hundred and fifty thousand dollar opportunity or higher, typically we lead in the field. Although when you're dealing with the Department of Defense. Uh, sometimes we still need to have field focus on a smaller deal. Um, those are the folks that go actually meet with a customer in person. Um, you might, you know, travel out to Fort Knox or uh, like Dave Dave Albright's about to do, right? On the whim, at, on the fly, and, and actually uh, cause everybody to scramble to backfill his uh, his role at the conference. <laughs> so we go to conferences, we we uh, man booths, we uh, you know interact directly with customers, and then there's what we I'll call it inside sales is a misnomer. So Dave brought up the acronym Enterprise Commercial Sales. What that means for us internally in, in the public sector is uh, telephone sales, essentially. But it's more than just telephone sales. It just means you don't go out in front of the customer, but you might get on a webinar. You might you know, need to do the same level of solutioning. And actually, we like to work really closely with, with our ECS counterparts. And I don't have a team call without having my, my ECS uh, counterpart members on the, on the call um, as well. But the main difference is they're not traveling there and they're, you know, still focused on the customer, but they're focused on, on smaller opportunities. But all, at the same time, they're always wanting to try to make that uh, opportunity larger so that there can be a handoff to the field. And then there uh, are similar roles. Well, let me, do, let me just go through the core Salesforce first. So we have a group that focuses on subject matter expertise. So like you might have somebody really deep in service cloud and and maybe telephony and, and know the industry and all the partners that we might work with to provide a call center solution. Or maybe it's marketing cloud because they, they have a, a, an in-depth understanding of building, you know, a journey with journey builder or, you know, select, I don't want to say Slack because that's not part of core. I don't know, sales cloud, experience cloud, platform. There's experts that we can tap into when we need to get really deep and that's that's when we bring that expertise in then there's security specialists so Steve Papino, if you haven't heard from him yet really a huge expert on risk management framework and compliance in the department of defense and actually outside the department of defense as well but uh, understands the the whole compliance chain and in, in FedRAMP and, and DISA and so forth and how to help customers achieve an ATO after after they uh, kind of move down down the road with Salesforce, and then we have enterprise architects and what their role is to help understand how how Salesforce can fit into all the other back end systems of record and maybe even integrate where needed, and all the other challenges that uh, that an IT organization might have. We can bring those folks in to help us navigate those waters. Did I forget anybody yet, guys, on that side? I think. I think that covers most of it. And that also comes back while you were saying that is the communication piece of what we do too. It's knowing when we don't know enough and how do we go to someone? Where are they? How do we get a hold of them? And how do we communicate? Hey, I need help. Right. Um, this is what we're doing. And and being able to pass, you know, that there's a, a telephone game that happens here too, right? The customer tells us what their pain points are. Now we have to tell a specialist what the pain point uh, is, making sure we get that information transferred correctly documenting and your discovery is yes key so one of the things that we do in the interview process here on my team is we we do discovery interviews where we have a mock 
customer scenario where you get a chance to ask questions about what that cus- what's important to that customer, what they're trying to accomplish and all that. And the key is to document it. And then when you come back to present a demonstration and, and, and like a, a PowerPoint deck or, you know, Google slides is what we use, then, then you need to be able to incorporate what you heard. Right. So document documentation is key. And then if you figure out that there's more in-depth technical understanding that we need internally, you, you reach out to the team. Or if you say, well, OK, I can't do this just on Salesforce core. I need integration. So I need to go to the MuleSoft team and explain to them what this is all about and, and get them to weigh in on it as well. All right. So we have we have Slack. We have Tableau Analytics. We have MuleSoft as well. So. There's a lot of moving parts and there might even be industry solutions that we need to bring into play, like financial cloud or something like that, where we have to understand what resources we can go and grab from the industry team. Yeah, those are great points. All right. So let me get to the next question. Let's talk about some hiring stuff. What what makes when you're hiring as a as a hiring manager, when you're choosing candidates, what makes a superior candidate for a solution engineer over someone maybe not? Yeah, I mean, I kind of, I'll, I'll uh, pin it down to kind of four areas. One is a demonstrated history of competencies and characteristics, the ones I shared before. You don't have to use those exact terms, but being able to say, I'm really good at customer communications and I demonstrated this in my role in the military because I you know, had to give up and give a day, a daily stand-up meeting or something. I mean, just that kind of thing. Right. And being able to relay what you learned in those scenarios and then maybe some of the, the downsides of it. Right. And then working through simulated discovery, demo build and, and all that. I talked about that earlier. Teamwork. So how does it manifest itself in interviews? Well, you have peer peer interviews with other SEs, maybe with account executives. It's an opportunity to demonstrate teamwork there also as you if you make it to the uh, the simulated customer challenge asking for help from the peer interviewers so we play roles and then once once we kind of go through the discovery then what i usually do is open it up so that you can reach out so like let's say dave dave albright's playing the role of a, a customer during the discovery well then once the discovery is over he's an se and you can ask him for help right because i talked about how important win as a team is i'm not going to send somebody off to go develop something without getting any feedback from 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 an SC that's in the current job and right that understands what's important to the customer so that's that teamwork thing is important there and, uh, and not lastly but anytime you're doing a demonstration or a presentation it's really important to tell a story because if all you do is and this would be the difference another difference between consulting and SE when you do a demo as a consultant you're literally clicking off work stream items like or you know sprint items yes i'm able as a you know a person in a recruiting role i'm able to see a list of all the recruits that i'm responsible for check you know and it's like really boring (laughs) you know i'm going to click this button and this happens contrary contrastingly for an se it's telling the story of why the person's life is better as a result of what they just were able to do and sort of making them think about the mundane way they do the job today and how it could be much better with our product or someone else's product right so telling a story is super important and much harder than it might appear i I tell people a lot when they're like you know, you work at Salesforce, what do you do? And, and a lot of times I do storytelling. I, I create a story and I use a product to show how it would fix the customer's pain. And that is the difficult thing to do because a lot of times when you do these builds, especially for those of us that maybe came from the delivery side, we do want to default back and be like, if I click here, it does this. And if I click here, it does this. And so cool. If I do this, it does this. But you will, you can literally watch people just glaze over when you fall into that. Whereas if you have a story of someone, for instance, you know, a young enlisted member who can't get his DD-214 as he's getting out of the service, people can relate to that and they can relate to that and be like, oh, that's that's not good. But you can then show the story as they go through the process and they're using the product to fix that solution and how it works. You can definitely, it definitely keeps the attention better for people you're 
showing it to, demoing to. Hannah, I see your hand. I'll get you in just a second. Actually, go ahead, Hannah. Go now, and I'll ask my question in a second. Awesome. So my, my question is kind of along the lines we were talking about of capturing the audience's attention. I know at least I've been told over the last, like, 10 years our attention span has drastically reduced. Now, I was wondering how you, you mentioned people's eyes glazing over. I was specifically wondering what's the, like, length of time you say, like, all right, this is enough. We need to cap it at, you know, X amount of minutes. So my answer to that would be there's not a specific time. There's a really good white paper book, I can't remember which, out there about attention span and, and, and doing technical demos. And the whole notion of you got to capture your audience's attention in the first two minutes. And then it kind of has this sine wave effect of, they call it the trough of despair, right? Like you're droning on about whatever technology and, oh yeah, I've got this compliance and that compliance. And you can see it in their eyes. And so then you have to bring it back up. And that's where the storytelling comes in. You bring it back up to a point that's going to make them feel part of the conversation. You might ask a direct question to somebody in the audience. You might ask for acknowledgement. Oh, hey, Bill, I know you're the uh, CIO. Does this compliance, uh, is that what you need to get an ATO? Or, I mean, something like that, right? So there's not a time limit. I mean, the Army, when we were doing the recruiting deal, it, they had a two-hour demonstration. Literally, you had two hours and you had to go through this whole checkbox. And uh, the thing that I think separated us and our partner from the other uh, respondents was they actually did role playing and, and and they and they planned it like they literally practiced it almost like they're acting in a movie you know they just went through this whole okay. role play thing and so the weird part of it was the the army personnel they were forbidden to say anything smile they had to be very stoic and just sit there but at the end of the day completely neutral feedback they were yeah they had to be neutral they said, yeah, you, you really separated yourself from the competition because you told the story just like it would happen in real life. This happened to be military moves, and it was like a, a military member and their spouse trying to plan, oh, my gosh, I got an employee in two weeks. You know, you're going to be stuck here trying to take care of all this military equipment or your uh, household equipment. And what do you do? And, and that would then it transitioned to a story of how on Salesforce Mobile you could, you know, submit online without having to fill out 27 paper forms and all that. Right. So that's an example. So it's really, it's really up to the moment of just, you know, how to decide, you know, the customer might say only have 30 minutes or they might say have an hour. Don't take the whole hour if you don't need it. Okay. Yeah. You, you definitely have to read the crowd. And, that, and I think we have an ongoing discussion sometimes, right? We've all done a, you know, move to work from home, right? And a lot of times our demos are from uh, what I call my nerd battle station right here. I've got multiple screens, multiple computers, iPads. I can do all kinds of crazy things. And I can I can give a good demo from here because it's my controlled world, but I can do a better demo. Every demo I've done in person goes better and I have better effect with the customer because I can read the room directly and I can interact with them. I can see when they're glazing over. I can see when they're fidgeting. I can tune the demo as we're going. If they start reacting to one section, I can focus on more that I can't see from the screens here, especially like Microsoft Teams with the Department of Defense. There's that ongoing, I don't know, there, there's just a little bit of tribal lore there that you know the, the bandwidth can't handle video. So everyone goes off video, right? So now you don't know yeah. what they're doing. Yeah. And I think that one of the first things that, you know, if you say, hey, can I record this? What happens? Everybody's video immediately turns off because nobody wants to be on camera. And now you can't see them anymore. So I try personally, I try to not record meetings unless it's uh, mutually beneficial to everyone on the call. Right. So. Yeah. And, and then you just have to try and ask questions and see if you can get feedback and then hopefully the story connects with them enough that they start getting involved with the story and they start adding parts in and then you know that you're at least communicating with them but if the, the hardest ones are when you have a demo and no one says anything and you're trying to get feedback hey does this resonate with you and nothing i mean it's just complete silence and you're just talking to a dark screen and another thing to kind of follow on with that, Hannah, is that sometimes our demos 
like Brian mentioned, there could be a two hour one. I just did an hour and a half one with another partner to about 40 people. And that was pretty intense, but sometimes they're only five minutes and that can be equally as intense because now you're trying to figure out how to fit this story and this demo into five minutes to get the effect you're looking for. So that's the other side of it. Yeah. A great example of that is conferences, right? You can't yeah. give a 45 minute demo in a conference booth, right? It's five minutes. And you probably don't want to click anything. You probably just want to show them a screen and go and walk through with your finger like, hey, this, 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 you know, right? Instead of giving a whole demo. And, you, yeah, you know, the, the, with practice, you the, know what, what to do and not do. The article I read that prompted that question, it said our attention span is two and a half minutes. So yeah. I was like, as an SE, how on earth would you execute on that, you know? But it makes sense. It could be two and a half and then you have to recapture it, two and a half and then recapture it, two and a half, you know? Right. That's exactly right. And hope they're not checking their phones and stuff like that while you're trying to talk. I mean, it happens. You can shame them into paying attention if you're in a room with them. You just can't yeah, do that. <laughs> yes, you can, you can give them the hairy eyeball a little bit and just right. kind of look at them. Ask them um, questions, and if they weren't paying attention, they won't know what you just asked them. So. <laughs> or if you got the boss in there and you ask one of the subordinates, and the boss gives them the hairy eyeball, now you've got everyone's attention. Yeah. Um, right. So we've kind of talked a little bit about this, Brian, and, and from the hiring manager perspective, I think a lot of people probably have this question on here is, you know, we've had some SDs come in with limited technical experience and only, you know, one or two certs. What's the difference? Why, why did they get in? Why are they the unicorns? I guess one could say. Well, I mean, just from experience, I, I like to balance the team skill set anyway. So, you, you know, you, you guys have seen this uh, on, on the team. We'll have experts in analytics like Greg, who's now manager uh, in the middle of my screen. I don't know if everybody else sees him. Hey, Greg, happy belated birthday. <laughs> anyway, he's, he, he came over from Oracle's BI team and knew nothing about Salesforce. And, but he knows a great deal about analytics. And so we had just kind of started down the analytics path. I'm like, I really need some analytics expertise. So I, I really, I use that as a, as a differentiator, but I, sh I showed you guys the competencies and the great characteristics. And if you can make the holistic view of all those things shine over someone who maybe has a whole bunch of depth and has done 47 implementations of Salesforce, then, you know, I might need that skill set. And, and the great thing about the way this team works is another three-legged stool is uh, your responsibility. So one, the main leg of the stool is your assigned accounts, right? Uh, so the, the SE that's assigned those accounts is responsible for, for them. They can bring other resources in. Number two is business expertise. So it might be analytics or it might be, uh, you know, running a call center that they, they ran before. And the third one is, is depth technical depth or specialty areas. And we, we call those black belts at Salesforce. And so if you, you know, you can, you can have good depth in one stool and, and then maybe a good, you know, sense of business. Like you really know recruiting well, cause you did that in the military or something like that. Then we bring you in for that expertise. And then on the account side, you don't necessarily have to have super technical depth if you can weave the story and, and do a great job in the presentation. So hopefully that it's the whole person is what I'm looking at. And I think most companies do it the same way. What if somebody comes over from service now and they've never touched Salesforce? Well, they'll, they'll learn it because they de demonstrated that they can use a SaaS environment, software as a service environment. I think that's a great point too. I, I like to equate it. I used to use this when I was in the military and aviation. You want different types of arrows in your quiver, right? You want you don't want everyone to be exactly the same with the exact same capabilities and skill sets. You you want to the way Dave Nava and I do demos is very different. Dave likes to be more scripted. I kind of free flow a little more, and there's strengths and weaknesses to each of them. And so knowing when to use what I think is important. Sometimes we may slide someone into a demo where we need something like that or a specialty. So just having that, those kind of different capabilities and, and looking at the whole, the whole team and figuring out what you might need or what might work, I think is important. Any questions from the audience since I've been talking a lot? 
Otherwise, I'm going to keep on firing questions. Go ahead, Raj. Good evening, everyone. So I have a basic, very beginner question. Very new to the ecosystem. For me, I'm just trying to understand a demo. Was that like for a specific way someone's going to implement Salesforce and then you're trying to show that to the customer? Is that what a demo means? Or is it just to kind of understand what, what the conversation's about a little bit? I mean, it's a little different. I mean, if you've ever watched like an Apple launch event or something, you know, you, you see people demonstrating their technology, whether it's like a new new cell phone or a watch or whatever, right? They're showing you all the features of that product. The difference for us is we're actually, because because we're a platform as a service and software as a service, we're showing them in their mind or in their world how how our platform could be used to solve a problem. So we're literally building a shell of a solution of how how that would work in their environment, as opposed to just showing them, you know, Microsoft Office. Oh well, here's the here's how you bold some text. Well, that's kind of you know, no offense to Microsoft, but that's boring, right? So that's that's what we mean by a demo in our context. You know, when I was at Sun Microsystems, I'd show them you know how they could maybe run a program on on the uh, Solaris operating system or something like that, but nothing tailored to their specific needs this is this is tailoring it to the specific needs especially since my team is selling to department of defense and if you see salesforce's marketing do you do you hardly ever see any department of defense stuff out there right so we have to imagine how we can use our technology to solve their their dod specific challenges Awesome, thank you. Could you is there a way you could share like a, an easy example of easy demo versus like a, a difficult demo that you or some of your team members have recently done? Dave, you wanna you wanna take that since you just did the OCIE demo? Yeah. And I see Dave Naba's got one too. We got about three minutes left. So I'll very quickly I had Army customer to replace or look at replacing how they issue out all uh, clothing and individual equipment, right? The OCIE, all your TA-50, all your kit. And that was a pretty complex solution. We were working with a partner off the app exchange. So basically we had like an app of their software, other Salesforce software from the app exchange brought in there. We used Experience Cloud. We used the app exchange partner. We had CRM analytics in there. And so walking that path through a soldier getting their first issue of equipment and me working back and forth virtually with another team member from the App Exchange partner as they click through their path. And then they would pass it back to me and I would start talking about the soldier again and click through some other things. So that, that was a pretty complex one. That was an hour and a half. That was the one that had 40 people watching it. And so they can be pretty complex. Dave Nob, I see you got your hand raised. Yeah, so I mean, there's there's a couple of different factors that go into simple versus complex demos. Multi-cloud demos are, are often more complex. How many how many clouds you're you're actually uh, implementing with that specific demo? So sales, service, experience. You know, are you bringing in uh, expertise like MuleSoft, like Tableau, like CRM Analytics to add additional components to your demo? That can be complex because you're working with more people. You know, are you are you working with a partner, like to David's point, do you have app exchange packages that you're having to download and then go through those as well, not just the core functionality of the platform. So really simple use case, case management, right? You live in Navy housing and your, your pipes break. So you want to be able to enter a case with privatized housing to have them come take a look at it. And you want to be able to track that case all the way through the process, be able to chat back and forth with your case manager in near real time through an experienced cloud community. That's an easy one. Right, you set up an experience cloud site, you've got your core platform for your, with your case manager using service cloud console probably, and there's a back and forth to personas, right? Personas is another thing that makes it more difficult. How many different people do you have to be in your process to show this demo? So one of the more complex ones that I did, and I know we were at time, so I'll, I'll, I'll wrap up, was, was forced risk reduction. So we have to conduct a safety investigation through all the different phases of the investigation across numerous different agencies with numerous different people. I had to invite, I know how to create CRMA dashboards, but I didn't have time to do that. So I had to invite an expert in to do that. Public sector solutions, we had to invite Omni Studio expert in to do that. And there was multiple personas, so it took in, in multiple clouds. So it took a while to get through that demo and to get in all the requirements. So that's just kind of a quick overview of simple versus easy.
or I guess simple versus difficult. Yeah, multiple personas really hike up the pain and the and the difficulty quickly. You get five personas in there, and you've got five different screens. You're trying to keep them, and they start caching on the Google pages, and then it gets very complicated very quickly. I did pop a link in the chat to our guided tours, which are essentially demos that are that have text around them, so that they're not you can't actually run the whole demo, but you can click around and see the message for each one of them. And if you drill down into the defense sector, you'll see several ideas of what we can do in DoD. Yeah, that would be good to kind of go see that if you're interested. Hey, uh, Dave, I know one of the questions you were going to ask me if I had more time was, what's a proud moment? And I, the thing that solidified the role to me was SGI was killing us in a demo. And it was my old group that I worked with in the Air Force. So I'm like, I don't understand how this could be. So I said, can you give me the code? And they, they gave it to me as written in C. And all it was was an infinite loop of square roots. That was it. And I'm like, hey, I, I you know, I, so I went to product engineering. I said, what's going on? Why are we getting killed? And they said, well, we took square root out of silicon and it's still in silicon and SGI. And I'm like, oh, okay. Now I know what the game is. So I went and said, hey, I wrote some other code that I think would be more representative of what you guys actually do. Can we run the benchmark again? And we kicked their butt. And then I was like, okay, now I know what the role of an SE is. Change the ground rules and win on an even, even playing field. <laughs> So anyway, that's my my going away messages. It's really fun when you win. Yes, and very painful when you don't. That's right. <laughs> very, very painful. I hope everybody has a great one. And, uh, you know, I, I'm trying to get reestablished on Veterati. So if you want to look for me there, once I get it reestablished, I'm happy to be a coach for anybody. <laughs> so we are at that time. Before we close, I'd like to thank Brian for co-hosting tonight's session. Awesome having you here and uh, getting your perspective on the topics we've discussed. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for attending. We hope to see you next week. Have a great Wednesday night. Have a great one. Take care. Thanks, Dave and Dave.